On the 17th day of October, Halloween gave to me 17 angels stripping, 16 demons jazzercising, 15 runes on parchment, 14 Joseph's whispering, 13 seniors bleeding, 12 creepy masks, 11 dancing demons, 10 Catholic monsters, 9 priests a miracling, 8 Jerry's vamping, 7 Jody's oinking, 6 body swapping, 5 reeds wolfing, 4 drunken uncles, 3 werewolf colonies, 2 spooky sisters, and a psycho who killed Janet Lee. Well, hello there, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the 31 Days of Halloween. Uh, this is the 17th film, uh, 17th of October, of course, in which we are discussing uh, the 31 movies that I picked and some that you picked. Uh, this is definitely a, a me pick. It is uh, The Blood on Satan's Claw, a, uh, a movie that I have seen. I kind of came to it late, uh, but I've seen it a few times now, and I really, really enjoy it. It's uh, a, an interesting movie. It's often grouped in with Wicker Man and, um, and the Witchfinder General, uh, often referred to as the unholy trinity of folk horror films. And it sits squarely in between the two chronologically, although I think uh, it probably has a little more Witchfinder General in it than... Wicker Man, although there is some of that too. But anyway, so it was originally going to be an anthology film. And it was originally going to be an anthology film set in Victoria and England. But uh, the producers at the time thought there had been more than enough film set in the Vic Victorian era. And plus, the Witchmaster General film had done pretty well. And so, borrowing a little bit from that they moved the time period back to, you know, sort of a 1600s era. And then you also borrowed from Witchfinder General the whole scene with throwing a witch into the, into the water. Uh, that was kind of cribbed from there by the producers. Again, because Witchfinder General had been so incredibly popular. But the film itself is... It feels like an anthology in some ways uh it tells sort of three different stories one is the story of uh the guy who is dating a, a woman who's sort of beneath his social uh status and brings her home to uh, his family only to discover that uh, she has been infected by some kind of deviltry and ends up having to be hauled away but he also has been infected and ends up having to cut off his hand, all uh, Ash Williams-like. And that's a really fun kind of story. And then you also have the story of the of, of the kids in town being seduced by the this devil uh, worship that is going on. And yeah, there was... You know, the, all, all of the film takes place due to this farmer having uncovered what seems to be the earthly remains of Satan uh, on on his farm. And then the, the third story in this triumvirate of devil horror uh, seems to be the, the tale of uh, a family that takes in, you know, this girl Margaret who has this fur on her leg and... Uh, there's also a magistrate who kind of comes to cleanse the town of all its devil worship. And so all of the this kind of hodgepodge of ingredients is, is thrown into this movie. And I think that's why I kind of like it, because it's always moving and doing something a little bit different. Um, but yeah, so the overarching story is after the skeleton is discovered that just... <laughs> devil worship and Satanism and whatnot seems to spread throughout this town. Um, a lot of the characters, a lot of the young people in particular in this village are developing these weird furry patches that one presumes will eventually be given over to this demon. There is some good old fashioned demon fellatio in this as one of the, one of the girls, sort of the main villain, sort of. 
uh, aside from the demon character, is uh, a girl named Angel, who's this very pretty young woman who is seducing a lot of her classmates into uh, into her devil worship, into this cult. Um, there is definitely an element of the Manson family, and that's kind of by design. I, uh, you know, the writers talked about how you know they they wanted to portray this idea of kind of youth gone wild and, and this amorality that was running rampant through the young people in this village. Um, Angel, who is our our girl who is seducing everyone, she tries to seduce the local minister, and to his credit, he kind of resists her, but then is immediately accused by Angel of having attacked her and so forth. But uh, he he gets released because as soon as that happens, they start finding, you know, other dead kids and witnesses are like, oh, no, this was totally Angel who, who did this. And yeah, and then, you know, the Magister comes and ends up having to uh, kill the demon along with Angel and a couple of the other kids to set things right again. The original cut of the movie, or not cut, but the original intent of the movie was that uh, th- this magistrate would come back and sort of enlist some people to help destroy the entire village. It was a much grimmer kind of idea, and the producers uh, decided that they wanted something of a happy ending, even though I would argue it's not a terribly optimistic conclusion for this film, but they they do sort of rid the town of evil. And, yeah, so the, the thing that makes The Blood on Satan's Claw kind of fun, aside from the fact that It is this amalgamation of three stories that are all sort of sitting somewhat uncomfortably alongside one another is that it feels kind of audacious for the time. Again, this was, you know, released in 1971, so it is a 50-year-old movie at this point, but it has, you know, full frontal nudity, and like I said, there's fellatio on a demon, and all these ideas of the youth corrupted in such a way that they're just taking over and the adults are left to just kind of sit and try to figure out what the hell to do about it. And there there was something contemporary about that at the time, you know, in the late sixties and early seventies, that was certainly the time of cultural revolution and so forth that would have scared the, the olds of the day. But even today, you know, there I, I don't want to get super political about it, but, you know, when you look at things like QAnon and the spread of misinformation and that kind of thing, and it, it basically creating this weird cult uh, within the larger society, you know, like the movie is still relevant in that way. And it's got uh, a lot of really interesting turns. The, the moment when the dude has to hack off his own demonically possessed hand again... You know, we talked about how uh, Curse of the Demon likely inspired Drag Me to Hell. Well, this likely inspired a little bit of Evil Dead 2 in its way. Uh, It's hard not to think of that movie when you see that scene. And the only thing that's really surprisingly conventional about the movie is that at the end of it, they're just like, okay, well, we've we've rid everyone of evil and everything's cool now. Thank, Thank goodness for the Lord. Um, and that seems a little easy, but I think that's maybe just because the producers insisted upon that change, but it still feels like, well, you, (laughs) you missed an opportunity to, uh, to, to be really dark the way that, uh, the Wicker Man is and, and the way that Witchfinder General is, but it's really good. It's a really good one of those in, in a world where there aren't a lot of those, uh, that, that sort of folk horror that. Uh, shows the corruption of a small town uh, or a small village in a way that's really interesting. And especially, probably the creepiest of the scenes is when um, a young, uh, the, the daughter of the, the farmer is seduced in into not necessarily joining the cult, but basically she's a, sort of a, a thorn in the side of Angel. And so they, they just end up, you know, dancing with her in this you know, almost a a pan like fashion to seduce her into this cult. And when she denies it, they just kill her. And, and that's where they're like, Oh yeah. Angel was totally responsible for this. And yeah, it, that kind of thing is really shocking in the movie. And also, um, it, it plays well with the theme of 
you, you know, that that corruption will destroy everything it can. And if it runs head head to head with goodness in the world, then it will either try to pervert that goodness or it will destroy it. And I, again, I not to get uh, too modern day about the themes of this film, but it was definitely something that I, as I was watching it, uh, you know, for the fourth or fifth time, I was thinking, boy, th- this movie understands that if nothing else. And in fact, the writer, when he, he talked about how they had to insert the uh, the scene of all the locals throwing this girl into a river to determine if she was a witch or not and he said you know i didn't really have a problem writing that scene into the movie because it was just another great example of being able to show how stupid these people were and and that's the thing you know they, it, like the movie doesn't go very far with the idea of the hysteria that this local cult causes but it does go far enough that it's a thing and I wish that had been a little bit more of a thing in the movie, but again, I you know it's hard to complain about what a movie is, especially when you're talking about a movie that has you know such crazy scenes in it. Like there's a great scene where Angel and her classmates are hiding the claw uh, that they've discovered in the field, the satanic claw from the minister who is giving lessons, and they're just kind of passing it along behind their backs and so forth, and. Uh, you know, again, just another great moment of like, hey, under the nose of the old and established people in this village that there is this cult rising and and they love it. Like the people in the cult are totally about it. Uh, and when um, Margaret, I think her name is, uh, gets uh, found after after she's been um, hounded by some of the locals when she is found by the farmer. You know, she just is like, hey, why don't you come join our satanic cult? You would love it. And the farmer's like, no, no, no. How on earth would I ever do such a thing? I believe in the Lord. And she just takes off on her own to warn Angel that, like, hey, these people are coming for you. Uh, You know, she gets a way out of this and refuses to take it even after they've, you know, sliced off the fur growing on her thigh and all that stuff. If you've never seen... The Blood on Satan's Claw, first of all, you absolutely need to. It is... It, like, it's not so bananas that it's hard to follow or anything, but it, for a movie that's 50 years old, there are moments where you're like, this is kind of shocking that this is part of this film. Uh, you know, the, the like I said, when you see fr- full frontal nudity in this movie in Angel's attempt to seduce this minister, you're like, well, they are, they are certainly going for it in this movie, and... Um, and it continues to kind of go down that path. It's a weirdly sexy movie, even though the sexuality is is sort of portrayed in a dark light, but there is definitely that element to it. And it's hard to tell at times, you know, who is the good guy, who is the bad guy in this movie. I I think that there is, uh, no clear morality, uh, defined in this film. Like surely the, the killer the killers within the cult are not ideal citizens, but also neither are the, you know, magistrate and his people just indiscriminately killing people. Um, and, and especially some of the locals who sort of take matters in their own hands to, uh, you know, kill young women. So yeah, it's a fascinating movie. It's really entertaining. Um, it's a great kind of period piece. Uh, where it's sort of like, oh, hey, look, look how stupid we were in the 1600s, but also not that much smarter now. So anyway, I love The Blood on Satan's Claw a lot. I think it's a terrific movie. Uh, if you have seen The Wicker Man and have seen Witchfinder General and you haven't seen this, again, 